So this week I had the opportunity to attend the Symposia series at the Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which some buddies of mine and I often attend and have since graduating seminary, even though we didn't go to this seminary. Somehow, and I'm not entirely sure how, this became sort of our, our annual class reunion. Now, it's not for the whole class, it's just for a few of us, but it's where we get to catch up, see each other, hear some papers, talk some theology, talk some casuistry, that is, talk about what's going on in our parishes, and, and, and so forth. But it also then presents an opportunity, because there are a good number of people who come to this thing. It's not the same people every year, but there are. it's, it's sort of a, a networking ground for Missouri Synod who's who liturgical confessional people. And it's not like it's all that clean and dandy, but that's what it is. And so I, I had the opportunity this week to try to seek out and grab a couple of interviews. As Project Resurrection has become Project Resurrection, one of the bits of feedback I got from people out there, you out in there in listener land, was that I could hold on to that raw idea especially when applied to the few conversations I'd had, Katie Sherman, Brian Wolfmuller, the, you know, and, and maybe pursue that a little bit more. And so that's what, that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to try not to throw all of them at you at once. I don't want to give up on Daniel too fast, right? I'm really enjoying that. So I'm going to try to hold these for weeks when I feel like I can't get to Daniel and, and drop them. But I'm going to drop one this week right away on you. And it's the, I'm just going to do them in order. I'm not going to be too picky about it. But So the first person I got to sit down and, and chat with is Pastor David Peterson. If you don't know his name, you probably should. He is at the forefront of liturgical, de, I don't want to say development is the wrong word, but defense within the Missouri Synod. And we'll talk about that a little bit. I'm not interviewing him about the liturgy, so we don't get into that too much. But he's really known for that. Uh, he's the editor of Gottesdienst Magazine, which is about liturgy and the divine service, God serving us. But we get into a really uh, extended conversation on life theology, the first article, order of creation, and how this applies to your life as an individual, and then for us as pastors, and then as congregations. How does a congregation learn to love good order? And, and does the orders that we have for running and managing our congregations, does it serve us? Or is it serving itself? Is it actually hindering the work of the church in our midst? Uh, I thought we'd sit down for an hour. It ended up being an hour and a half, and it could have gone much longer. In fact, I hope to do it again sometime. I've been very pleased. Each of these interviews has been such a pleasant surprise. So uh, without just sitting here and, and yammering about how I talk to people, uh, without further ado, here is my conversation with Pastor David Peterson. Please enjoy. So today I have the privilege of interviewing Pastor David Peterson. Are you a doctor? I should have asked you that. Well, I have a doctor of ministry degree. Doctor of ministry. Dr. David Peterson. Uh, you are the pastor, senior pastor at Redeemer Lutheran Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Do you go by senior, administrative, or are you just, you're both we just, just pastors? We're just pastor. Both yeah. just pastors? Both, yeah. And you're going to have to educate me here a little bit on, on your um, achievements. I know you're an editor for Godestines, the Journal of the Lutheran Liturgy. And from what I've seen from Emmanuel Press, there's a number of your sermons that are being published recently. Thy Kingdom Come, Lent and Easter sermons, and God with us, Advent and Epiphany sermons. But I have this inkling that you've written something else as a book in the past. Is that true? Uh, I mean, I wrote a book a long time ago for CPH, right. a Bible study thing on numbers. Okay. So you aren't... Do you, That's really it, I think. Is there a, the conduct of the service? Did you have something to do with that? I mean, I was involved in that, and also the... Um, uh, the other book by uh, uh, Paul Lang, okay. um, Ceremony and Celebration. But, but I mean, I didn't write those. We just, you know, uh, uh, facilitated the publishing of them. And, uh, Were you connected at all to the Brotherhood Prayer Book? Not really. Okay. No, I was. Uh, I helped those guys because they were students when they put that together. Okay. And so um, I was involved in it in a little bit of a sense. I gave them space. We kind of helped them, but no. And it still kind of lives here. You know, because Ben Mays is a member here, and of okay. course Michael Fries is the other pastor, and it's their, their, their baby. Yeah. yeah. So for those who don't know of my listeners, Redeemer Lutheran Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana, is a congregation with a strong history of liturgical practice. Uh, to the level that I would say, the first time I sat here, I was a little, uh, I don't, don't want to say confused, it was new. Um, I've grown up in 
what we call now Divine Service to Lutheran Bur Book of Worship, West Coast, Missouri Synod. And so to, to see the, the care and attention that's given to the liturgy here as opposed to, it's not like it was unliturgical, it was very much liturgical, what I grew up in, but very different. Um, uh, a level of reverence and concern that, I think, ultimately is sacramental. Redeemer is known for that amongst pastors, at least, and pastors who uh, desire to be liturgical. You can't be and not know about Redeemer and its practice here. Also a congregation which had a school uh, once upon a time, ended up closing that school. How long ago do you, what was that? Uh, 45 years ago, almost. Oh, wow. So it's been, uh, Maybe not quite that, but yeah. So, so the school's been gone for decades, but now... Just this last year, two years, is two years re now, yep. rebooting a classical school, kind of because it just sprouted up out of the ground. All I have is Heath Curtis mentioning it at a, as he was consulting my congregation, which we're in a school closing process right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, but it, uh, he just mentioned it kind of just fell out of the sky. So just uh, two minutes on that idea. Yeah, yeah, well, of course, nothing falls out of the sky, um, though it, it obviously appears like that from a distance. Uh, I, again, I wasn't much involved in that. Um, that was uh, one of our members, Nathaniel Pullman, who has a master's degree in politics from Hillsdale, also a bachelor's degree there. Uh, and his wife is the managing editor of The Federalist. Oh, wow. So, okay. so they're yeah. very uh, connected and, and, and aware, good thinkers, and concerned about the world and what do you do about it. And so, you know, they, uh, she, Joy Pullman is actually kind of the world expert on Common Core. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as a I mean, an expert who's very critical of it. Sure. Um, so she's been on Fox News, a bunch of stuff like that. So, so they had very much a concern about education and, 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 and what's ideal for children. And uh, they said, hey, we want to do this school. And I mean, it's been, I, so we, again, we just kind of gave them space to do it. Yeah. Um, we did things to kind of protect the congregation a little bit, uh, uh, which, I mean, I think there's going to be more and more of this going on where they're a, they're under the umbrella of the congregation, but they're their own 501c. Okay. Yeah. So we try to limit somewhat our liability with them. Um, they're really they're financially independent of us, mm. so we support them a little bit. I mean, we give them space again. You know, they don't pay utilities, that kind of stuff. And 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 obviously, I mean, we're their we're their funders, you right. know, the people within the congregation, but not the congregation as an entity. Yeah. So uh, that's the way that it's gone. Um, we've been very blessed in that, you know, Nathaniel's been able, he's the headmaster, and with Joy working for the Federalist, I mean, they've been able to swing it that a lot of his time's been donated. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's how it's gone. I, I mean, as far as the school, it's, I mean, that's just kind of uh, the process that it's taken on. Uh, as far as what they're doing, it's just phenomenal. I mean, I'm, this is probably, I, I mean, it's hard to, but I've been here at Redeemer for almost 19 years now, and I think the opening of this school is certainly in the top two or three most significant things that's ever happened. Wow, okay. And I, ne I did not anticipate how wonderful it would be. It's, huh. the, it's the greatest thing. How much involvement do you have as a teacher? Uh, all I do right now is we do matins every day, mm -hmm. and I do catechesis with the children as part of matins. Okay. So, you know, I have a half hour every day or 40 minutes every right. day with them. And... Uh, they're all pretty little right now. We started with just what would be kindergarten and first grade. Now it's kindergarten, first grade, second grade. So it's you know, we and we only have eleven students right now. Okay. So it's it's pretty as it get as they get older. That's going to have to be modified. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I don't have. I mean, it's not a burden at all. No, but getting to do matins every day with them's got to be a little bit of a joy. It's a, oh, yeah? it's a blast. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. I did matins by myself for years oh. or with two or three people. Now it's full of children. Yeah. We sing, you know, the hymn of the day, recite the. It's marvelous. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I so, love it. And uh, I was warned that we may hear them all going by at some point during this conversation. They're going to come running down this uh, this hallway. So that's for, I'm saying this for the listener again, right. that if you hear the kids in the background. So uh, that direction of, of the where well, you're talking about separating the entities and the reasoning behind that, the idea of uh, congregations as first article or real world organizations, that's some of what I want to pick your brain about, in part because along with Redeemer appearing to be a liturgical success in an age where many people say you can't do that, you can't, you can't be a surviving congregation with, with the liturgy. Uh, a site along with that, Redeemer also gives the appearance, and maybe I'm, I'm just in, uh, mistaken in what I look at, but it gives the appearance of being a fairly successful organization. 
And that's what I, I'm, I'm very, very curious about. Why is it that some congregations just fumble to keep themselves together and, and others don't? Before we go there, though, I want to kind of lean into this in it from a tangent, and this may be a bit of a curveball, but I was sitting in this conference room uh, waiting for just a moment, and I, I decided to look around. I see all these beautiful pictures of Luther, and I, I see this bookshelf with Luther's works, and there's ESVs and some LSBs, and then there's this tide of iron, gates of something, tank war tabletop game. And I'm, I'm, it sits out of, out of place just slightly. I'm curious, is that, is that accidental? Did someone just forget that here? Is this uh, something that you're into? You play tabletop game with the elders? And, uh, and no, what, well, <laughs> this is, uh, no, uh, it, did, it, it is in the wrong place. It wasn't put away. But um, I got a Lilly grant to do one of these sabbaticals about 10 years ago. Mm. And it was uh, revolved around tabletop games. Really? And uh, That's the, con- cool. the congregation uh, put together, I mean, that was paid for by the Lilly Foundation, a whole library of these games. Huh. And so we still, it's kind of faded away. I mean, it's not an active part of the congregation, but there's still a closet full of these games. Huh. And there's children in the building constantly, because we also have a, a very heavy uh, homeschool contingent here. Okay. In, yeah. in addition to the school. And so uh, these games get kind of dragged out and left around. So I also knew someone had told me once you were a, you drove a tank. I did drive a tank. Oh, yeah. I, I was a tank commander. Yeah, I couldn't handle. I was too seasick to drive the tank. Thank God I was a, a an officer, so I didn't have to drive. Yeah. I could have my head out of the hatch. <laughs> oh, interesting. I never thought about how that would affect your your uh, your balance, right? That because it's it's turning while you're driving it. Like well, the, the, the problem is the drivers down in the in the American tanks and the M ones. You know, the 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 drivers down kind of by the treads, and he can't see. Wow. So, you know, he's going up and down over the terrain like a boat. And almost. just kind of being told where to turn. Told where to go, and you can't see, the, you, know, you can't see anything. So it's kind so. of like being in a submarine, then, yeah, a little it's, bit. It's, I mean, I, I, I think I was fortunate. I didn't know I was going to be made sick by it, but I couldn't do it. Yeah. Huh. So. And then <laughs> back on tabletop games, that's, I have a, a, an interest in love of tabletop gaming. I've recently started Dungeons & Dragons with my kids, and we're having a blast with it. I got, I got five kids, and four of them can play. So you don't choose to do a, a grant or a, a sabbatical study like that unless you've got an interest in, in tabletop games. So you do have a, a long interest of games? Or? Well, I did. I mean, it's, we've kind of, uh, at, when our kids were young, yeah. and um, we had gotten into Catan, this mm. was before you could get them. You know, yeah. So like a, they were called German games in those days. I don't know if you remember oh, that. Oh, no, no, I'm too young. Uh, that was what they were called. Huh. Uh, and, uh, you know, they were kind of rare. You had to go to specialty shops. Yeah. And, uh, so we got, we, we'd had a, a Catan, and then we started to get some others. We got interested. And, and then we, kind, we had this idea, the, the grant, you know, those grants don't support those early grants, you can't do anything academic at all. Oh, I didn't and, know that. Yeah, and it's difficult for our guys, Missouri Synod guys, to get them because, first of all, all the Missouri Synod guys want to do academic stuff. The The second reason it's difficult for our guys to get them is that Lily really prefers to support things that our guys are not interested in, like going and learning how to worship like a Hindu yeah, right. or that kind of stuff. Right. And so it's always like, you know, this kind of exp- experiential thing. So Anyway, I was looking for something because I wanted this grant. I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a three yeah. month vacation. Yeah. Who, who doesn't want that? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so what we did was we built it around. You have to have a congregational component. Uh huh. So the idea we had this gaming library, also a cookbook library, and a devotional book library. Okay. And then the idea was how can we foster kind of family night and and devotional life? Yeah. And so if we had it was like Rachel Ray quick cooking. Let's yeah. have let's have people actually stay home. You know, together as a family, have dinner together, have devotions, play a game. Huh. So that was kind of the basis of it. Yeah. And then I got to go gallivanting around the country and goof off for three months and get paid. Yeah. It's great. That's fun. really cool. Um, <laughs> so this has another connection that's still a bit of a tangent, but is one that I kind of want to share with you and then hear your own experience with it. Because again, you, you, you are in the Missouri Synod pastorate, young confessional liturgical public eye. Whether sure. you like it or not, you, you are, and you have been. And my first experiences with you, you were, you know, this huge figure doing liturgy and all this. And, and yet I heard you somewhere speak about the book 300. And I don't, I don't know how much that means anything to you if you're— You, you mean the comic the book comic or the book? book? The, com- okay. the comic book 300. Uh, Frank Miller? Frank Miller, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I didn't know anything about it. I went out, I ordered a hardback 
printed copy of it, big, beautiful thing. And to this day, it's it's one of the very few books I display in my study. It sits <laughs> there, and uh, the story of Leonidas remains near and dear to my heart. Um, the, the connection between Thermopylae and Persia and some of the things going on in the intertestamental and exile period as well, I find absolutely fascinating. So it just... Is that something that was a big deal to you at one point in your life, or was that a throwaway line that you don't even know you did, and it, it, it hit me like that? Uh, I don't. I mean, I am so I'm very interested in uh, in the classics, mm. and so of course the Battle of Thermopylae. I mean, that's huge, right? Um, and I've read Plutarch, and I've read. I mean, I'm not a classicist. I don't. Right. I don't. I don't read Latin. I don't. So I'm just an amateur completely. But uh, but I have a very deep interest in that, and I also have had uh, always a big interest in comic books. Yeah, okay. and, and I'm a Frank Miller fan. Huh. So I don't remember saying that. I don't know what I said. Why I mean, you? there's better stuff to read than that on Thermopylae. Why are you a fr- yeah? There there is. But why are, <laughs> why are you a Frank Miller fan? Well, I, this is probably just. I mean, I was in high school. I was a comic. I liked comic books. Huh. And when I was in high school, The Dark Knight Rises by Frank Miller came out, and it was so different. Hmm. You know, The Watchmen and, and uh, The Dark... I don't know how much you know about comic I, books. I do, I do. I actually am a fan, too. It's been a while since I've been way into it. But So yeah. what, what did you find was different? What, what struck you as unique? I got into comics during the Image comics. Oh, okay, a little after that, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Well, what was... I mean, you had this kind of dark... So before that, um, and, and mostly what I had read before that was Spider-Man, actually. That was my sure. introduction. So I liked, in, when I was younger, I really loved how Stan Lee would kind of talk to the audience and how Peter Parker had kind of normal problems I could identify yep, with. Yep. But then as I kind of got into high school, I mean, it seems sort of childish. Mm. So, uh, you know, the, the Watchmen and The Dark Knight Rises, uh, oh, I, I loved also, I love Miller's artwork. Right. So, I mean, the art's obviously a huge part of comics, but, but this sort of, uh, which is, it's, it's silly in hindsight way, but it seemed realistic. It seemed yeah, sort of right. possible. Right, and right. it was gritty and it was dark and, you know, it, it didn't feel like childish. So I guess that's why I loved it. You know, that's, that's good. Uh, that, that's a good thought. Um, and I, I ask again because uh, it's, it's something I'm very curious in. I'm curious about the overlap of storytelling and art because I think that has a lot to do with the church, right? And, and much of what I'm trying to do within the storytelling element of, of my podcast is capture what comic books do but in an audio form and, and try to show how the Bible has the best stuff. It, it just these amazing, amazing stories. So um, thank you for letting me uh, pursue that thought a little bit. So the, the direction I'm going to turn it now, which again, these are all first article things. There's all this fighting about the 30s of the law, and, and I'm not against the 30s of the law, but I think the problem is not that we don't have the 30s. I think the problem is we've abandoned first article thinking. We, we don't treat the created order as if it's a created order. We act like somehow now that we're Christians, we can just go do whatever, and, and it all kind of is going to work out. And while, by all means, the promises of God are the thing which predominate and drive the church, the Word of God is going to accomplish what it, what it says and what it does, some of that is to drive us back to a love of the first article. So what I want to kind of dig into you with you a little bit is just that theology to start with, that idea. And I'd like to then pursue it in, in a couple of corners, how it's impacted you as a human, as an individual pastor, your own uh, patterns or, or actions or habits, the way you apply uh, discipline in your life. I'm not talking moral discipline necessarily. Right. Uh, and, uh, and then the congregation and some of its history. And, and how you fit into that, uh, whether you've changed it uh, and whatnot. And then again, to, to bring it back a little bit to what it looks like with the school now, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that, and then the homeschool overlap and the balance of those things. So let's just start with, you know, first article theology and maybe your own spin, and I did it very loosely there, but your own, your own explanation of what that term even means as I throw it out there as jargon. Yeah, well, I mean, it is, the, the reality is that God is good, and the created order was given for us. I always come back to, uh, I'm just astounded, you know, at the beginning of Genesis, that the stars are put into heaven for the sake of marking the seasons mm-hmm. and showing us. I mean, the, I mean, the stars are these huge, ridiculous things, you know, all these light years away, and, uh, and they're, they're here to serve us, hmm. right? Humanity is the crown of creation. We're given dominion over the earth, and all of this is fitting together deliberately in God's plan for for us and that's corrupted by the fall to some degree but restored in Christ 
And we see uh, in the created order a goodness and God's mercy and care for us, right? The, the fact that God is still talks to us, that there's oxygen in the air. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, if, because the, the threat was, eat of this, you will die. And right. they don't die. I mean, there's a spiritual death there, but they're not destroyed. The, you know, he comes seeking them. Adam hides in fear because he thinks God has changed. God didn't change. God still loves Adam. He comes in mercy seeking to be reconciled with Adam. Now, part of that is rebuking Adam, mm. telling, right, and, and, and so forth. But, you know, the word of God doesn't change. Uh, the, the, in fact, the, uh, well, this is really, uh, to me, just a fascinating thing. But, uh, you know, uh, if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. Is that law or gospel? Mm. Neither, right? At least from a confessional perspective, because the confessions say the law always accuses. There's no accusation made there. Right, right. So if it's law, which it isn't, but if it's law, it's third use of the law. Mm. It's just simply instruction about what is good and what Adam loves, because he loves the things that God loves, right? There's, it's not gospel. It doesn't forgive sins. Mm. Well, in a sense, it's neither law nor gospel. It's the word of God. And it's after the fall, when Adam changes, that now he perceives the word of God differently, mm. sometimes threatening, accusing, you know, sometimes forgiving, and, and, and so forth. So there's this uh, reality that creation itself comes as a gift, mm, right. you know, out of love, and, and that order itself is comforting. So here's another thing that's kind of related that I, I think is really interesting because we, our whole law gospel thing is problematic, uh, as we know, in many ways, because it's, it's an oversimplification that becomes cliches, that then becomes, I mean, at least at th it has the danger of becoming, right. and I, I mean, I wrote my STM thesis on law and gospel, I'm a law and gospel guy, and, you know, I'm a Lutheran. You're not, but you're not talking about that, that law and gospel are wrong, you're saying that the way that we use the terms has, has problematic limitations. It's a limited vernacular. Well said, yes, yeah. I think that's right, and it's subject to abuse, especially when we when we use kind of this terminology as a way to sort of force our own ways into things rather than an experiential reality. Uh, and we try to kind of use it against one another, against God, that sort of thing. Yeah, sure. So, so the, the thing is, is one you of the things like we say. sound like Yeah. <laughs> I'm what serious. A, that's true, I know. <laughs> well, there's a reason that he was, that he, you know, is so uh, helpful in many ways, but uh, he, he's... He's got a, some serious problems. Agreed. <laughs> uh, but anyway, and I mean, that's, that's how we ought to read all theologians yes. anyway, with discernment and carefully uh, and critically. Anyway, the, uh, we often talk about, well, the, the law can't comfort. And that's really a misleading statement to say hmm. because there is a reality that the law does comfort the Christian in the sense that we rejoice in the order and we rejoice in the fact that, uh, you know, think of a child you know, and the comfort that the child has from being disciplined by his mother because he knows that the world has boundaries and safety and she's looking for him and she cares for him. And we see this, I, uh, you know, and see again, so it, it just depends to some degree what you mean by the word law, but doctrine to some degree, all kind of doctrine is in a sense law. It's categorizing, it's establishing limits, but there's a comfort in it in knowing what our place is and where we fit. Um, so, you know, the fact that, uh, I, I don't I'm trying to think of something, you know, just the, the consequences of creation and the reality of creation is law, hmm. but it comes to us as gift out of God's mercy. Right. And, and the order itself is comforting. That's why Christians love doctrine. Yeah, yeah. Um, or even, uh, I often use the example of, you know, when you've been, suffering for, for years with strange symptoms and the doctors can't diagnose it and and then finally you know it gets this terrible name like god forbid you know parkinson's or something right there's this funny phenomena where there's relief that comes with the name right right i remember when i was uh diagnosed with sleep apnea if, uh, uh, when the phone call finally came to give the results and they said you have it my first words were thank god <laughs> yeah because I'm not a lunatic. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and, and so that is fascinating. I love, I love what you said, that order itself is comforting. It, it was created by God to be a gift to us. And then to not put that into the jargon of law and conscience and morality, understanding that it's fallen, that in our experience of it has fallen, and to, to my favorite line from Ferdy, I think, is that we misuse the good things of God in the worst possible way. So, so we take this 
order that's been given. We make an idol out of it. We try to justify ourselves with it. This is why the law then accuses us when, when it fails to be our God, right? So uh, that is all there uh, behind and under this glorious light of the proper distinction between law and gospel. But I'm, I'm with you in that I want to explore the order without being trapped into the language of first use, second use, third use, because I want to just love creation for what it is as well. I don't want to get rid of that language in its proper place, but I don't think it necessarily applies. Is my time management second use or third use? Like That's just the wrong question, right? Right. I think that's right. And, and with that, though, I think that we have trouble, especially as Missouri Synod, with things like time management. And, we, and that's going to then lead us a little bit into uh, congregational dynamics as well. But um, let's let's go then toward your personal world a little bit and some of your disciplines. I don't know what you do. Maybe you're a complete you know, mess all the time. But uh, I, I can't imagine you've achieved what you've achieved in life without some form of uh, uh, focused discipline to how you handle your days and your time. So experience with that, uh, business reading, entrepreneurial reading, um, uh, time management reading, I don't know. We don't have to go forever on it, but... It, your thoughts on that direction? Yeah, well, I am. Uh, I do all of that. I'm. Um, <clears throat> I'm very much into kind of productivity stuff. Yeah, sure. I I I, re- I subscribe to productivity RSS or whatever that you know what yeah. I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. I don't even know the lingo, but uh, so the big things that I use now currently. I mean, it's, it's all, you know, you're always tweaking this right. and falling off the wagon and getting back on. Uh, but uh, the two things that I find most useful. Uh, are some version of a to-do list, which currently now I've been doing the bullet journal thing, sure. a modification of that. Uh, but it's just a glorified to-do list. The, I, I always have used a to-do list. The only difference with the bullet journal is uh, I have a, a journal, and so there's a record of what I've done. Mm-hmm. And, and I like the I like the ability to make some lists and things that I can refer back to. So right. it's been a good thing for me. I'm not, I haven't, ad- you know, everybody adapts it to himself. Right. So the but anyway, some sort of way of tracking the tasks that need to be done um, and, you know, so that I don't lose sight of them. And the other great thing for me with that, which everybody says with bullet journaling, and I've been onto this for years, is that when something comes up, if you can write it down, you can let go of it. Yes. So you don't have to yes. worry about remembering it. So just, yes. boom, I'm going to write it down right now. And so like... So the advantage of the journal, I'll just say over the to-do list that I have in the past, is now I have, pa- I have you know, a page that's dedicated to books I want to read, movies I want to see. Yep. And uh, you know, that's just a great thing, because if I had that at the bottom of my to-do list, when the to-do list is full, I'd throw it away. Or you've got to rewrite it. Or, or whatever, rewrite yeah. it. So, so you know, that's, that the journal works good for little things, not huge things. And the habit tracker I like, too. Yeah, that's cool. Bullet journaling is something that I've explored. The uh, The adaptability of it is uh, what's great. Um, I have uh, my own critique of it, but I, we can, I could share that with you another time. It's, it definitely, um, I did it for about a year, and it, it was it's a huge step um, in the right direction. There's something about the analog level of it, too. I, I've done a lot attempting to do it all via computer and have it all be digitalized, and it just becomes a ball of mess really yeah. quickly. And Bullet Journal lets you pull those things apart and kind of space yourself away from them. Uh, you, you mentioned writing it down and having it like no longer have to be done. So are you familiar with, um, or I'd be on your mind, are you familiar with Getting Things Done, David Allen? Yeah, I am. I, I read the book. Okay. And uh, I, I don't know, for some reason that just didn't appeal to me. Mm. Um, I, I mean, I think that I, it did influence me some. So that well, I that idea say, is like a key principle. Yeah, the idea is a great idea. Do do the things that you can do right now and get and get over with and so forth. There's another book called, uh, but anyway, a, a book that was more influential than that book for me was this book, Eat the Frog. Oh, I don't know that one at all. Uh, and uh, I like the title. Yeah, and the, it's it, again, you know, they really you've got one idea to make a whole book out of it. Yeah, you know, they could do it in a paragraph probably. But the uh, Eat the Frog is basically you do the hardest thing in the mor- first thing in the morning. Oh, right. Because sure. you're going to run out of willpower. Yeah. So do the thing you don't want to do. Right. And uh, But the, the thing I use the most than, uh, than e- any of this is this Pomodoro. And I may have talked to you about that before. No, I'm not familiar with that either. Oh, you don't know Pomodoro? I don't even know how to oh, spell it. it's the best. Oh, I don't know how to spell it either. <laughs> it's some Italian word for apple or something, I think. I can't remember. But th- it's, it's, there's nothing to it. Here, here's all it is. You, I set a timer, uh. 25 minutes. And I'm going to work on one thing 
solid for 25 minutes. And then there's a five minute break when the timer goes off and then you can start again. But if you're in the flow, you just ignore, I mean, I'll just yeah. keep going, of course, yeah. why would you? Yeah. Well, for, and, and so uh, I'm pretty strict about it. I'll tell the secretary, don't knock on my door for 25 minutes. Yeah, I'm not sure. answering the phone, nothing else. Look, we're not medical professionals. Anything can wait. Right. Tw you know, at the worst is if they call at the exact minute you start, they got to wait 25 minutes, right? That's right. not that long. And, of course, chances are they're going to call 10 or 15 minutes. They're not going to wait that long. Uh, you know, it can wait. And that ability to focus on one thing, right, to do nothing else, of obviously you're not going to look at email or, or, or anything right, else. Right, right, right. Um, and so for me, like when I was trying to accomplish – what for, for me was difficult, like finishing this D-Men dissertation or write a book or whatever, you know, it would be, it would feel overwhelming. And, you know, I'd get started on it. I'd say, okay, I'm going to work for an hour. When I was, this was back when I was doing my STM thesis, when mm -hmm. I really started it. And I was like, okay, I got a two hour block. I'm going to work on this. Well, you know, I get 10 or 15 minutes into it, bored out of my mind, mm -hmm. you know, just want to shoot my, I mean, you can't, right? Right. It's too so, big. It's too big. So I, so I would end up, you know, kind of quit or whatever. Well, with the 25 minutes is just magic for me because you know i could get going for 10 minutes and then be bored and want to quit look at the timer okay you can do 15. I get, I, yeah 15 yeah. and then i can quit yeah and it would enable me to keep going because i knew there was an end and you know very frequently getting over that 10 minute or 15 minute hump then i'd kind of get in the flow and yep. i'd be able to just keep going yep and then it's like grace you know yep. i mean it's just like this is free time it's like so i do this with we do this with tithing i totally believe in tithing and uh, that uh, this is in the Bible. I think this is the, I mean, look, we don't kick people out of church for not tithing. We don't kick people. I expect our members to come to church every Sunday. I expect them to read the Bible every day, and I expect them to tithe. Now, I have no idea how many of them do all that. Sure. Um, you know, obviously, we got people that, you know, come to church once a year. And, and, you know, they're members here in good standing, technically. So, I mean, you know, we're not legalists. We're not. But, I like the adverb, uh, technically. Well, so, you know, <laughs> right. I mean, I'm just saying that. But that's what, the, that's what I expect as the pastor. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I love tithing. It's like, so the great thing about tithing it, for me is, it has been my whole marriage, because my, my father-in-law taught me this. We just, boom, 10% off the top. All income just goes straight into the church offering. No questions asked. We don't even think about it. Mm. Well, then what happens, of course, is other things come up that, that, we, that we love or care about that we want to support. And then we just, we just give freely. Yeah. Without right. any kind. And there's no, like, I don't feel guilty if, you know, if you come to me, Jonathan, and you say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm starving and I'm homeless and I'm out of gas. I don't feel guilty if I say, no, I'm not going to help you because I tithed. <laughs> yeah, right. But I, I know this is, I mean, I, I, it's a kind of a mental thing. Yeah. I, I'm not saying this is, but as a spirit. As a discipline, yeah, sure. I'm just like, look, I've, I've, I've kind of, I've done what I'm supposed to do, but now I have the freedom right. to, 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 to give you money, to help you because I want to, right. in a sense, and uh, maybe that doesn't make sense, but it's, it's a related concept to me. Yeah, 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 I think it, I think it makes sense. It, it's about the order giving you the freedom to then do more, really, at the end of the day. Um, you know, when you're talking about the homeless, uh, this just came up recently in Bible study, you know, there's the, always the trouble of if they want cash, how are you really helping them? So that, that's a whole nother yeah, uh, sorry, barrel shouldn't of monkeys. Yeah, sorry, shouldn't use that example. Yeah, but, it, and then, but I, I think that the, the point uh, makes sense. And so g going back to the Pomodora, the, the 25 minutes, it, it, it seems like not only does it give you that short goal, small wins, you know, you have small wins so you can win off and then you'll want to win more. Um, but then uh, it's, it gets you past that starting point thing as well. Uh, one of the things I've been trying to tell myself recently is uh, 200 words a day, because 200 words is nothing. Right. You can do 200 words in 15 minutes, um, but you never write 200 words. You start going, the ideas start flowing, and, and you do quite a bit more than that. So I, I love that as well. Same kind of idea. Um, it sounds like we could probably just keep going on bullet journaling and, and this kind of stuff, but I want to transition a little bit to then – your experience in congregations, and I'm going to leave that really broad and open. I know Redeemer's not your first call. Um, you, I don't know how much of this kind of productivity you're into when you had your first call, but just to kind of uh, paper trail it a little bit here or, or breadcrumb it, from first call on, I have been stunned at the lack of organization in Missouri Synod congregations. 
with the tremendous amount of red tape paperwork that we pretend as organization that we pile on top of it, right? right uh, that generally ends up harming both the Christian and the congregation. Now, that's pretty broad, so I'll let you kind of just uh, read into it what you will. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm with you, and I think that... Um you know, and of course, there's different sizes of congregations, and diff- I mean, there's all sorts of unique yeah. situations for every place. But I think typically, uh, and probably almost without exception, our constitutions are that, that that are supposed to be guiding how we operate are incredibly complicated and ridiculous, mm. and uh, tend to be more of a hindrance. Why? Um, I agree, but why? They're too. They tend to be uh, too binding. And, uh, you know, too specific in things. You have to have six elders. You have to have this kind of thing that they don't allow kind of adaptability. Um, and they don't allow uh, a, some, I mean, again, you know, I know constitutions are all different, but I think there's a tendency to kind of over legislate mm-hmm. things like, you know, what do you do if there's a vacancy? You have to have a special voters meeting. Well, that's ridiculous. You, you know, you ought to allow the council or the chairman to appoint, you know, just different things right. like that. So they're just lots of spe- specificity in constitutions that actually could be a hindrance. And, and of course, usually they're just not followed, which is fine, except if it's you illegal. get sued. <laughs> yeah, right. So, you know, the, uh, so I think that, you know, there's a funny thing that our constitutions are inflated mm-hmm. is really, I think what happened was we're trying to protect, or, or when these things were formed, it was kind of infected by a spirit of American capitalism and corporatism and also pretending as though we were more than what we are and not really thinking about the church as the body of christ but thinking about the church as a, a corporation a the, school board or something. we don't but we don't think about it as those things i don't think enough right as a corporation well i mean the problem is is we're thinking about it as the wrong sort of thing i mean we're thinking about it as this complicated yeah, large okay. bureaucratic organization that needs lots of checks and balances and so forth and not really the kind of because what it really is, is a family. Mm. And I mean, the family dynamics are what I think are more, in, we ought to be more aware of. How does, how do we operate, uh, uh, you know, when, okay, so you get into now the reality is, you know, grandpa's cranky. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, know? right. And, and, and um, you know, but we, but we still love grandpa and how do we work around him and how do we work with him and how do we actually honor him and get him to do what he's supposed to do? Right. You know, and, and so there's a lot more of that kind of stuff that goes on. Yeah. Um, when was the last time your family had a board meeting? Right. <laughs> That's not the way we operate. <laughs> no. You know, exactly. So the, it's really, it's a fa- but there, but families still have to do all the, you know, there's still planning involved in a family. Right. There's still, right. you know, assignment oh. of tasks, organizations, chores, you know, well, oh, that runs straight into the idea of fatherhood too, and headship, and uh, in marriage, even uh, a relation between man and woman. I mean, there's so many implications there. I, I don't know if we need to go quite into that, but I, that is really curious. How do you? I'll, I'll ask it this way then: you, you can wave a magic wand. How do you organize a congregational family so that you can still be a nonprofit? <laughs> organization, right? Right, right. Well, I mean, I think we have to have the sort of corporate stuff. I wasn't really meaning, but we have to, I think, have kind of two things simultaneously. And I think that our constitutions and, and that kind of legal side of it could be, mostly should be simplified to allow kind of as much flexibility as possible. But then there's the reality that, you know, we're not making decisions uh, as the leadership of the congregation purely on financial you know, you know, we're, we're thinking about, rela- we're thinking relationally. Mm. And so there's all these funny, so I'll tell you some of my kind of tenets of congregational leadership that I've developed. I mean, all of this stuff, I mean, including the, pro- all this stuff's come by, you know, failure, basically, right. you know, right. and, and, and trying stuff and learning and being frustrated. So I'm not trying to say I got all the answers and I'm still working on it. But one of the things, I mean, there, there's a number of things that I think are tempting for, for pastors and for congregations. And one of those is to try to get people involved by making them be involved, <laughs> which never works. Oh. So it's like we've got a vacancy or, you know, we've got, we, here we've got a member that comes, you know, once a month or every, every, every other week or just kind of hot and cold. Let's make her a Sunday school teacher. Right. No, don't. Because people have kind of a level of commit that, that commitment that they're comfortable with and is natural to them. 
uh, I, I'm not speaking biblically here, right. just experientially. Yep. And the problem is, as you try to push them beyond that, it, no, I've not seen it work. I've not seen people get more active by assigning them a job to do. What happens is the job just falls through the cracks, and now we have this problem of we don't know how to handle it because we don't know when she's going to come, and if we try to do it for her, she'll be insulted, so then nothing. Right. So I'm a big fan of vacancies. Yeah. I would rather have a vacancy on the board than have a person in it that's not really committed or reliable. And the problem is is that you have to make, again, a kind of pastoral decision because if you put this person on the spot and you say, will you be committed to this? And she only comes to church once a month every other week. She'll say yes because she knows she's supposed to. Right. And she wants to be in, in part of her. So you can't ask her that because she's going to tell you what you want to hear and what she thinks she should say, and then she's not going to do it. In my experience, getting a group to acknowledge that a vacancy is okay mm-hmm. is one of the hardest hardest things to do as a pastor. It's, it's private confessions probably harder, but yeah. not much, yeah. not much, uh, because the Constitution, for whatever reason, will ignore it, and yet then we won't, right? right. So we have to have a VP, even though the guy doesn't do anything. Serves like no purpose in most constitutions. Right. So we got to make someone come to a meeting once a month, right? Uh, I don't. I, I feel like this is an idolatry of sorts, and I don't mean that in a way that these are all non Christian. They're not Christians, but the way our flesh manages to just kind of wiggle in and attach itself to things that we think are going to give comfort, without then, for whatever reason, the pagans are better than us at this. They they can assess the organization for what the organization is supposed to be without turning it into kind of a view of the church itself. And, and again, that's kind of broad and wiggly there. Um, let me shift it a little bit then back toward Redeemer then. It, am I, I, you, I, I think I sent you an email maybe six months ago uh, where I asked you for Redeemer's constitution. I was trying to gather constitutions and, and you guys did give it to me. Not everyone got me one. Uh, and I just found it last night when I was doing some, some uh, purging of my reference files. And I found it there, and I glanced at it, and it looks pretty typical. I didn't read, but it looks pretty typical Missouri Synod style constitution. Uh, is it? Um, have you done much tweaking on it? Uh, and then with that, how is your experience of Redeemer when you came here? Am I wrong in my 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 uh, experience or my viewpoint that it's this sort of long-standing, well-organized thing that at least has been able to pass itself forward a couple generations without completely collapsing? That's a, there's a lot in that question. So yeah, well, we, we we actually are in the process of tweaking the Constitution right now. Yeah. And one of the things we're doing is getting rid of the vice chairman, and just simply so we just now have that the chairman will assign someone on the board to be the vice chair. Because we don't need a vice chair right. month to month. It's just stupid to have right. a position with no job. So stuff like that, we are trying to uh, simplify some of these things. Um, Redeemer has, a, like everybody, a complicated history. It, so I, and I find it fascinating, but uh, I don't want to bore you too much. I'm, I'm curious. So it, it was part of its, its English district. Mm. So it was you know kind of very pro-America, anti-German, you know, anti-school, typical kind of English, you know, in the name of missions, Mm. right, we want our kids to be Americans and to look like Americans, smell like Americans. Now, never had anybody, I mean, you know, any kind of statistical significance join the congregation that wasn't of German ancestry. I mean, that's the Missouri Synod, that's the English district, right? Right. Um, But uh, so anyway, that was, but that's what they wanted to be and that's who they were. And as was very kind of normal in the founding of the English district, or, or at least somewhat typical, pretty liberal in terms of within that era. Okay. You know, uh, uh, you know, wanting to be kind of progressive, wanting to change. So that was Redeemer's history. Then the English district become, or the English synod becomes part of the English district. We're Missouri synod. Uh, and then we got there, for, so that was in the 1880s, 90s. In 1941, Erwin Kurth was called to be the pastor here. And he was their kind of really first celebrity kind of pastor. Okay. He wrote, uh, uh, I can't believe I can't think of the name of it, the catechetical book, which you probably know. Kurt's Catechetical Helps. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he was, uh, he was very involved in TLH, which was published in 1941. He was assigned by the Commission on Worship for the Midwest to take this choir of three w- women around the Midwest to teach the music of TLH to other congregations, wow. you know, just like they yeah. did with LSB. Yeah, yeah. So 
uh, and so he was a liturgical guy. He instituted every Sunday communion. He, he inter- you know, TLH was high church yeah, in some ways right. in those days. So, so that was the beginning of kind of the Redeemer liturgical stuff and the sacramental stuff. Kurth also signed the Statement of the 44. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, uh, most, most listeners won't know about that, but it was sort of a pre-liberalism leading to Seminex thing, so without going I don't yeah. too far into that. It, it basically was, we should commune with other Christians. Yeah. That was yeah, the yeah. gist of it. Missouri Synod's too strict. So, so Kurth was part of that. Then he left, after t- left in 1950. Herb Lindemann came, uh, and he was, again, kind of a powerful preacher, a presence in the Synod at large, and you know, very much on the left of things now. Okay. Um, and again, signed the Statement of the 44 and was uh, uh, also a huge Seminex supporter, yeah. part, yep. part of all that. So Redeemer was a Seminex congregation. Wow. And then he left in 75 and, and Charles Evanson came, my predecessor. So he, they had a Seminex supporter over the 73 to 75, he leaves in 75, and they did not leave Synod. Right. So this was the wow. thing. So he left. He went to Valparaiso and then very shortly went to what ended up being the ELCA. And um, he had been gearing the congregation to leave. So the congregation, T. spoke at Redeemer when he was doing his tour yeah. in Fort Wayne. Yeah. And uh, so the congregation was uh, divided, but the minority was kind of for the Missouri Synod. Hmm. Uh, at this, so we got big, big division in the congregation over that. We also had the assistant pastor was having an affair with the office secretary. They were uh, the assistant pastor. Just to make things easier. Yeah, the assistant <laughs> pastor was having cowboy masses oh, and things nice. on yeah, Saturday night. Sure. The and and the other, you know, so there was kind of this liturgical thing, but it had kind of gone weird and yeah. kind of Valparaiso liturgical yeah. dance and some other stuff. So we had worship wars going on. Yeah, yeah. And since the 19, since the end of World War II, the neighborhood was in absolute decline. Uh, the two most violent home invasion murders that have ever taken place in Fort Wayne happened in the late 60s, early 70s, um, within blocks of Redeemer, huh. uh, where you know, uh, and I mean, uh, and I mean, it's just a typical story of the era. And I mean, there's all sorts of controversy whether it's true and all this, but there was the accusation was this young black man enters into a house, he murders the whole family in their beds, uh-huh. he goes to jail, he commits suicide, so Ugh. that's why they don't know if he Ugh. really did it. Right. And then another house down the, you know, a bl- couple blocks away a year later, again, a young black man enters into a house and mer- murders an elderly white lady. Well, this, uh-huh. I mean, so the white people of yeah. German ancestry right. just leave the, de- they're leaving the neighborhood by droves. Right. So it was just a perfect storm of everything bad almost that could happen to a congregation. Here comes Evans, I mean, inherits this. And uh, he's just a rock. He just endures. So he's here from 75 to 2000. Huh. Twice in that time, they call voters' assemblies to remove him from office. Wow. The congregation, we're, we're transferring people out, you know, by the hundreds <laughs> almost yeah. a year. And uh, so the congregation shrinking, financially destitute. Evanson has to close the school. Okay. It had only been open a few yep. years. And uh, everything's kind of bad, but Evanson just endures and suffers. <laughs> And he, I mean, God be praised for him. He saves this congregation for the Missouri Synod. He just simply won't move. He's very patient. Um, the congregation's sending money to Seminex. So, I mean, they're supporting Seminex at some level, but he won't leave the Synod. Right, so this isn't just him being a jerk. Like, he's holding to the Bible is true, and the congregation has been trained to believe it's not. And that's what, at, underneath all the rest of it, that's why people are leaving, right? Well, that's one of the... I mean, there's just all sorts of reasons for them to right. leave. And, and, but, uh, but Right, right, right. The, the neighborhood and all that, too. Yeah. But in terms of his endurance, there, there's this image of the, the steadfast pastor who just is a... He, he's, he's holding the line, but he's actually just kind of a jerk. And uh, th- that's not quite the picture you're painting. Um, he is very much in the midst of the, the trenches against some real false teaching. Yeah. In the congregation. And he correct? and he didn't, yes, but he didn't take it on very head on. He was just kind of endured and just patiently, quietly hmm. uh, went about things. Um, so, I mean, he was like, a, you know, he didn't say we can't send money to Seminex. Um, but, wow. you know, yeah, you know, he, he kind of but he just he just kept going long and he game. just wouldn't leave. It was a long game. And, you know, by 1993 or so things had really settled down. The congregation finally calmed and was just steady. And then I came, you know, 
seven years later. He, uh, he was also a brilliant theologian. Mm. Very, I mean, he just died uh, about three months ago. Okay, we buried him. Did he stay here? He he went to he was in Lithuania for twenty years okay. almost, and uh, and then he had gotten uh, part or uh, ALS. Yeah. So he was in Florida, but he yeah. was buried out of here. Um, he retired to Lithuania, or did he just? He got a call from the Fort Wayne Seminary and was deployed uh, over there and then eventually was called, you know, just one of these right. bureaucratic kind of things. But he did he did theological education in the Baltic countries. So you're looking at this call on your desk. I don't know what, what background brought you to the point where you're on the list or any of that, but you're looking at this call. You're looking at the, the information about the congregation. What was your first uh, thought? You know, or did you already know about Redeemer and have like a, a draw to it in some way? Yeah, I knew about it from when I was a student at, okay. in Fort Wayne. And, uh, and then I could just see that it was just a diamond in the rough. Okay. I mean, Evanson, uh, again, he saved the congregation. Things had, things had calmed down and were steady. But, you know, he, there was a cost to be borne for suffering that way. And uh, he had kind of a siege, you know, he had endured a siege. Yeah. And so he kind of still had that mentality. And uh, so anyway, they were kind of sitting on a lot of resources, and I thought a lot of stuff was ready to be done, and I could see the, or it seemed to me, and I, I don't, it wasn't the only one. I don't right. think I had some kind of, you know, brilliant insight. Right, right. But I mean, it was it was pretty obvious. This This place has got potential. It's got resources. You know, things aren't what they used to be. Well, Good that's kind of, that, that gets us back to our, our loving of order. So what do you mean, you don't have to go too specific, but when you say that, like you, you looked at it and you saw the congregation had potential. Like in our first article discussion from earlier, what, what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, I mean, I, I, this is going to be depressing, I'm afraid, to a lot of pastors here in this. I mean, frankly, we had demographic strength. Okay. Uh, it's it's almost impossible to fight demographics. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the neighborhood had already declined, where it couldn't decline any further. Right. Um, and um, and the congregation owned the building, mm. and the congregation had a small endowment, and so there were some resources there. And then um, I could just see that you know, having come through this history, the people. I mean, this is the biggest resource, of course. The people that were left, there weren't tons of them. I mean, I think in those days our attendance was. I, we didn't have a hundred people in church on Sunday okay. morning, so yeah. it was pretty s relatively small for what we were they were trying to do. Um, it was probably about eighty, but those people were committed. Yeah, they weren't going to leave. Um, so, for a, a, a story I often tell and and, and think of, uh, uh, I I I don't commune people that have left our congregation and joined the ELCA. That's okay. Okay. I'm so, with you. <laughs> so if they come back for Christmas Eve, you know, yeah. to visit their parents, I don't commune them. Yeah. Well, this created a lot of problems, uh. Uh, and I destroyed our Christmas Eve service. We went from like 250 people down to like 60 people oh, on wow. Christmas Eve. And uh, first year. Yeah. So, well, the, no, the first year was 220. <laughs> yeah. And the right. second and year was yeah. 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 Right. And then the third year, it kept going down. But uh, the uh, the thing the thing that was really hilarious to me. And, and strange to me, having come from another call, was so that I'd have these, you know, here comes mom, who's a member here, hmm. and she comes in and she tells me, you're going to commune my children, hmm. because they were confirmed here. And I said, you know, th uh, that's the reason I'm not going to commu commune them, because they broke their confirmation vows. Yeah. And, you know, they're, and I'm not going to do this. And, you know, I tried to explain it and teach and, and the whole bit, but, you know, she wasn't buying it. Yeah. Uh, but she was able, this was the amazing thing about the re people of Redeemer at that era, she was able to distinguish and to separate kind of my decision and my theological opinion and the way I was going to conduct my office from my person. Uh. So she was like, you're wrong, and on the last day when you have to stand before Jesus, you're going to find out. But, you know, I can understand that you're trying to do the right thing and you think you're doing the right thing, and I don't hate you, and I'm not going to quit, and I'm not going to talk behind your back. Wow. And I'm not going to withhold hold my offerings. Wow. I know. See, that's huge. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I really w have been blessed by that. And I was like, when that happened, and this wasn't like a one single event, I was like, I mean, this is fantastic. Now, I never did get those people. They never did come. You know, they're all gone, basically, yeah. now. Yeah. But, um, I mean, they never did believe me yeah. in, in those things. But there was this marvelous thing where 
you know, I was the, pa- they weren't quitters because mm. <laughs> if they were going to be quitters, they would have quit. Yeah. You know, and they weren't, and they just kind of had this idea that, well, you know, the pastor needs to do his job and we can come in and tell him what we think, but ultimately we're going to allow him to do it. That, I mean, that's, that's a huge thing. That's I, a huge thing. Yeah. I mean, that makes all the difference. The, um, I, I've been in a number of different size congregations with different dynamics and it's only been in the very large ones that the family-run business mentality uh, has not been there. Where, you know, yeah, you're the pastor. Uh, yeah, we called you, but it's our church, and this is how we do it. And that's not always, like, to your face, but it certainly is in the water. And so to not have that, I, it makes me curious, too. Um, the only places I've ever seen that not be was at, a, at Bethany Naperville, where the congregation had 400 on a Sunday. So it's too big for everyone to have a vested interest in what gets done, and they just have to let go to the staff mm-hmm. a little bit. And then I've experienced that currently in Rockford, which formerly was a congregation of that size, like Redeemer was formerly a congregation of that size. Something about the, when it gets so big you can't have your hands in it, it just becomes, yeah, the, the office is going to deal with that. I'm curious about that, because then it, it, the next question I had, kind of even before we got to that, was so so what do you say to you said this is going to be depressing to pastors who might listen to this i don't know if pastors even listen to this podcast but what what would you say to a young pastor who is he cares about productivity he cares about organization he cares about the longevity of the congregation and he is in a parish that that doesn't and he can't move that ball i mean is he does he just have to do 25 years of evanson indoors is that yeah, is that I, it? I really, I think that's the only answer. I'm, I'm sorry in a sense. I wish there was some other way. Um, but, you know, I think he takes a hit for the team. He sets it up for the next guy. Yeah. The way right. Evanson did for so, me. So explain that. Just put some, put some meat on those bones. I love that. Sets it up for the next guy. There's this weird, um, uh, it's not a mythology, but it's this weird family trait in the Missouri Synod. Like, we don't believe that the outgoing pastor can leave information for the incoming pastor. I think it's nonsense. Every time I've left, I've left a packet with the guy's name on it, information about the shut-ins and, and what their needs are, information about the congregation, where I've moved them. You don't have to move them that way, but it's where I moved them, right? We, I don't know why we think we can't do this. So anyway, sets it up for the next guy. What's in that phrase for you? Well, I mean, he's going to, you're not going to get your way, you know, you're going to endure and suffer and, and, and put up with it. But see, part of the problem, like with that family business mentality, is that's based upon the fact that this fam, these people expect to outlast you. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, they've, they've outlasted everybody else. Yeah. Right? Nobody's ever stayed that long. I mean, you got to, you, if you're there, if you can, if you you know, and I, and again, don't hear me and not every, you know, not every situation is made for this and not, you know, so I don't, I'm not saying it's wrong to leave, but if a guy can stay, he can make changes over time and he will just win. Evanson won. They tried to remove, they voted to remove him the first time they missed by like seven votes to get the two thirds they needed. And then the second time they missed by like 20. So, I mean, he was not popular here. I mean, it was ugly and people were mean to him. But, you know, he outlived them. That's what I mean and by setting and much of, but I agree with you too. The, there's this other funny thing about the Missouri Synod that's related to what you said about, there's all these myths because we become these weird charismatics when it comes to the call. Yeah. Uh, that's not Lutheran. It, you know, the thing is, is look, the Holy Spirit, this is a divine call. The Holy Spirit works through human means mm-hmm. and human means are messy and there's no reason not to take advantage of it. I, I tell congregations, you absolutely should interview. I don't even know if you remember oh, this. Oh, yeah. In the old days, there was like this taboo. I oh. think they should listen to his sermons. Yeah. <laughs> you, it, you Which could, is, that was taboo too, right? Yeah. You oh, yeah. To uh, because this is an institutional fantasy that every Missouri Synod pastor is orthodox. Right. You'd, right. you'd have to be just, or comp- check your brain at the door to believe that. Or, or competent. competent. Or all, any of that. And also to some degree is going to fit. Right. Okay. But yep. all of that's legitimate. Yep. And it's not sinful for a congreg- a call committee to want to get a pastor that's, they ought to all want one that's orthodox and so forth. So, I mean, it's, it's just the same kind of stuff that we can't talk about these things or we have to act like this, you know, this Holy Spirit just works directly and, and so forth. It's ridiculous. Or can't overlap or have contact with the, I mean, there's a place where the, you, you could leave and be a, a thorn in the flesh of the guy who follows yeah. you, right? You don't want to be that. 
Um, yeah, the, the way we handle the call, to bring it back to your family uh, metaphor from earlier, it's like we do mail order brides. Yeah, almost, that's right. right? Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just, it's insane. Um, with the, talking to the guy about the long game, and I, I threw that phrase out earlier and, and you seem to have it resonate with you. I don't know if we have to talk more about it specifically, but I know from my experience in hard calls, what I did not have was grit. And I don't know how to get that grit. I still don't know how to get that grit, much less how to give it to a younger guy who is finding himself in a similar situation. And I think we're deceiving ourselves if we don't recognize that a large percentage of the best Missouri Synod congregations are organizationally dysfunctional and financially in dire straits. And this is going to continue for the next 30 years, 40 years, maybe more. Where do we get the grit? How do we stop... um, I'm going to use a different word, complaining to each other like little girls about how hard it is to be a pastor in America and actually just decide to do what needs to be done to win the long game. Well, I mean, some of what we could do is go get a real job for a while and find out how hard that is. Really is, yeah. You know, the uh, there's nobody. I don't know. There's such vanity in in the pastoral office, which. Okay, so we do actually have, and I'm I'm not ashamed to say that the the vocation of pastor is the most important vocation in the world next to mother and father. It, it's, it's, it's the means by which God is established and, and by which he gives out the gospel. So we shouldn't act like all vocations are just equal. There, there's a whole other problem with, with Wingren's version of Luther's theology on vocation. Oh, it's all law that, again, is problematic and creates problems. But anyway, the, uh, not all vocations are equal. Uh, and... Uh, and vocation's not only law, so those are just two things to talk yeah, about yeah. some other day. Yeah, yeah. But the uh, uh, but the thing is, is that every vocation, I mean, not even vo- every job, has is hard. That's why they pay people to do it. And <laughs> yeah. and the thing is, is that the things that were that pastors are suffering and enduring in in their calls are not in, mostly not unique. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just that we elevate them because they have a spiritual component. But, you know, people put up with, they, look, we don't often have to fire people. That's one of the worst things in the world. We don't often have to deal, depends if you have a school and stuff. Ooh, human I wish relations. we could fire a I know. or two. <laughs> well, that's another thing I'd love to talk about is this kind of what is pastoral leadership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we don't, it's not the same. Yeah. As running a business or no. being in the military. But anyway, I think so some of the getting over this is to kind of get over ourselves and recognize, yeah, I have to do things I don't enjoy because this is a job, mm. you know, and I'll, I'll be frank for me. I don't uh, really enjoy going and seeing the shut ins. I know there are guys that do for yep. me. I do it. I, I, I schedule it and I do it because I have to do it. And if I don't schedule it, I'll put it off, put it off, put it off. And um now, I, uh, God be praised, you know, I often enjoy myself when Once I'm there. Once you get there, yep. But I just hate going. I don't want to make appointments, you know, yep. whatever it is. So, look, yeah, there's things you don't like doing, um, and you still have to do them. And, you know, if you worked in a bank, you'd have to do things you don't like doing. How much of this... So look at it as a job, I a think. A job <laughs> and, a, and a war. Yeah. And a war. Uh, I, I'm convinced that the loss of martial language in the church is a huge loss for the whole church, membership, laity, particularly included, but for the the pastorate, uh, young men in battle. I mean, if you're in the trench, you really think you're going to get a foot rub. I mean, it, this is this is where we are. You should expect to be hated. I've actually, there, I won't mention his name, but there was, a, I think it was two years, maybe just a year out of SEM, ran into one of the, the leading professors from St. Louis when I was there. He kind of asked how it was going, and um, I, I shared a little bit. He said, well, is there anything we could have done better? And I said, you could have told me they'd hate me. Yeah. Like, you could have just told me that. You could have pre- prepped me for this. We don't. We, we are, and this is where, as much as I'm into productivity, we treat pastoral education, at least in my experience, like theological entrepreneurship. You're, we're prepped to go run a small business that will succeed because you're going to be so great at figuring it out, as opposed to theological warfare. And uh, almost spy level warfare to some extent. It's not like you want to lie to people, but you don't have to come in and change it all the first week. You can take a slower approach and play the long game, and you can learn to um, uh, well realize it's a fight and that you're going to get your nose bloody sometimes, and that that's okay. It's part of the job. Stand back up, right? Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Well, I always say, I always use this line. You know, when you're in the, it, it, the uh, our, fa- our grandfathers at the Battle of the Bulge. You know, they weren't writing and saying, you know, send us more socks. 
they were saying, send us more bullets. Bullets, yeah. You know, um, because they were engaged in a fight, and what mattered, you know, they weren't going to win the fight with Sox. And I think an awful, again, right? So to see it as a job that there's just tasks I have to do, some of them are unpleasant or aren't entertaining, you know, but just, and and, and to quit thinking that I, that, you know, the purpose of of being a pastor is to feed my own spiritual needs all the time. Right, right. (laughs) But again, just to look at it kind of just coldly, you know, you go to work, you know, you need to be to work early. (laughs) You need to do, you need to accomplish tasks. You need, and you know, I, look, we all have our, the things we don't like, the things we push off. I'm terrible at actually administration. That's why I, I actually try to do some of this stuff because otherwise it's really bad. Um, and, you know, I think there are coping ne- mechanisms and devices. You can try to find somebody to help you, you know, externally. And yeah, things. yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, the, the, just looking at it as a job instead of, you know, that I'm this holy servant that's been sent to God and people don't appreciate me. You know, uh, I always give this story of maybe you've heard me before with this waitress thing. Mm-mm. You know, so here's the other thing. We exaggerate our own sorrows and, and the significance of the conflict we have with our members. Hmm. Uh, so what happens is, you know, uh, a guy comes through after service and says something impolite or kind of rude to you and, you know, insults you in some way, right. whatever, or in a meeting, whatever it is. Well, you know, he goes home and really forgets about it. Yeah. So the, the, what the example I use is, you know, we all eat at restaurants. We've all had waitresses. We all think we know what a waitress's job is. And we think we know how to do her job. And when, and when we have bad service, we, are, we, are, we, we think we know what bad service is. And so we're, we're angry about it or we're frustrated and we're tempted and sometimes probably have said something rude to her or left a really small tip to teach her a lesson because yeah. that wasn't good service. And then we walk out the door, we get in the car, we're gone. Yeah. We have no idea what that does to her. Yeah. Right. And we don't know what the circumstances are. Who didn't show up for the shift? What's going on in the kitchen? Yeah. You might have had exemplary service. For, for what for, was going on, yeah. But but you just judged it on your own little world. You don't know, right? You don't know what's going on, but you felt like you did. Hmm. You 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 break her heart, right? And then you get in your car and drive away. And by the time you get to the first stoplight, you forgot all about it. She dwells on it, right? Yeah. All night, you know, yeah. can't sleep that night. Yep. Well, I think there's a similar yeah, phenomenon. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. And and so what happens is we make too much of what people. We ought to realize that they don't know what they're talking about all the time. And that they also don't really quite mean it. Right. They're just like us at the waitress. If, we, if they knew, they wouldn't. And the truth is they're not most of them. I know there's some evil people out there. But most of the time, they don't really mean it. They don't know what they really said. And if, and if, you, if there was the opportunity, the ability to show them and so forth, they would, be, they would apologize. Yeah. Um, so I think we take their criticisms too deeply in a way. Does that make sense? It does. It makes a lot of sense. And most of the guys that have suffered, like, you know, they're going to get removed from office. It's real. It's like Evanson. It's really hard to get two thirds of the lay people to vote against a pastor to remove them. Yeah. Um, But usually what happens is our guys break psychologically, which I'm, again, I'm don't, I'm not criticizing. No, it's it's a problem. And we got to find a way to to deal with it. But if they could, if we could get them to, to endure a little longer and go to the voters assembly, they might outlive it. Right. You know? Well, and that's what my question is again about grit and uh, (laughs) Nietzsche here, will the power a little bit, you know, how can we, so what what I love about um, hero movies and comic books so much that the heroes that I'm drawn to are these guys who endure. They, they, they literally just don't budge. Um, I don't know if you've, you mentioned Spider-Man earlier. I don't know what you thought about the Marvel cinematic universe. I've adored all those movies. I love what they've done with them. And I, I loved infinity war more than all the rest because Thanos is the best protagonist I have ever seen because he, he, he endures and sacrifices for the good. He's wrong the whole way through. But his his will to do what must be done. And I, I, I so much of this here is my own, you know, psychological need, uh, trying to find that for myself as I wrestle with these little quips and comments that I come home and, and oh, it's so bad. They did, you know, what was the one just recently? It was such a silly little thing that was said. You know, and I just, I rolled over it all afternoon and, and, and trying to find, you know, can, can I find the pro- productivity? Can I find the psychological help? Whatever it can be. What, what continued learning can I do to become better equipped to be back in the trench 
so that I ask for more bullets rather than wonder about my socks. And, and some of that then is, is I guess, what the, the edge of this podcast uh, that, that is interviews is going to continue to pursue for you listener out there is, you know, my, I'm trying to learn how to be better at what I do. Brian Wolfmiller said this really well. He, he said, um, I, I want to be equipped to do more good. Right. And, and so that's so much of what this is and, and, and what my questioning is for you. I really would love to just keep going uh, on and on. We're over an hour. Um, if you don't mind, uh, maybe 10, 15 more minutes. I have some some quick hit questions I'd okay, like to just sure. go with here. So yeah, two to five sentence kind of answers. Um, how do you measure success at the end of your day? Uh, that's why I like a to do list. So because the problem is when I didn't have a to do list, uh, I would come home and my wife would ask me, what did you do all day? And I wouldn't be able to tell her. And I need, uh, so I measure success by having tasks and having completed them. Um, so I don't, I don't think we should be thinking so much about, is, was that, there's a place for this also, but was that a good sermon? Was that a good Bible class? But I mean, just, you know, did I write the sermon or do this part of the sermon? Yeah. So that's how I yeah, measure checking it. checking off the list. What is something you believe that most Lutherans do not believe? Oh, oh um, well, uh, tithing we already mentioned. Okay, um, yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, that's good. there you go, tithing. Okay, that's a great answer. <laughs> you were going to say something else, though, did you? Have... No, I don't know. That's that's good. What book have you reread the most, and you can't say the Bible or the Confessions? Uh, I'm sort of embarrassed to say. I think the I've read the Lord of the Rings four times. Okay. I normally don't like to reread. I read a lot of fiction, huh. um, and I normally don't reread anything, and I never want to watch a movie I've seen ever again. Really? I know. I, my wife thinks I'm crazy with it. Like I would, if I've seen the movie, I don't want to see it again. Oh. I always want something new. Yeah. That's okay. probably a weakness of me. With, with that said, it, you say to read a lot of fiction. Um, best fiction book you've read in the last year? Uh, I reread, uh, speak of reread, I reread The Canticle of uh, Leibowitz. No idea about that. And uh, I had read that in high school or uh, in college and uh, did not appreciate it. And so... Who's that by? Uh, I think the last name is Miller. I'm not positive. Huh. What's it's it about? A, it's a uh, dystopian novel, a science fiction novel written, I think, in 59. And it's about... Uh, there's a nuclear war and the rebellion after, by the survivors is against the intelligentsia because they enabled the war. Okay. And so they, they destroy all technology and they're against knowledge and learning because that will enable us to make weapons of mass destruction will kill everybody. And so there's this strange dystopian thing and then the, the monks preserve knowledge. Oh, interesting. It's really interesting. So it's kind of like a Middle Ages parallel. And it's, so it's got a lot of philosophical and religious Is depth the to style it. Uh, Fahrenheit 454? Four is that that's the wrong number, but yeah. Um, or or is it is it more modern? Because uh, that that book reads a little older. C.S. Lewis sci-fi stuff is still kind of um, uh, it's got this weird edge to it that's very pre-80s. I don't know how to describe it. Writing shifted with TV significantly. Yeah, no, it's old. It's fi fifty-nine, and I mean, it, so you know, I mean, I think in some ways that's a better writing, but it, it certainly it shows and you know his an imagination of, of technology yeah you know the things it's it's hilarious to see how we've actually surpassed their fantasies in some ways with like phones yeah sure but then other things of course like interstellar travels nowhere right. near so yeah cool that's thank you that's a great answer um who is your uh, speaking of thanos right who is your favorite fictional antagonist uh well i love anything with nazis okay. you know they're just all, they're so evil it's, it's great to yeah <laughs> Uh, what is the best tool you have purchased for your day-to-day -day life? It's probably the journal. Probably I'm the journal. Answer for you, but yeah, it's probably the journal because yeah. I don't really. I mean, other tools, I don't really. Yeah. I I think I I was with you when you were saying about the computer. I don't use the computer for planning. Okay. Or for tracking stuff. Uh, in in you know again five sentences. To, What's the first 60 minutes of your day look like? like or, or to ask it differently, what's on autopilot in the morning? Well, what's your pattern? Well, I have some, uh, uh, these days I exercise a lot. So some mornings I get up early and go to the gym. Sometimes I do that later in the day. If I come to, if I come to work, uh, it's, it's planning. I mean, it's coffee, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, planning the day, making sure this to-do list is set. 
Uh, and then I will do kind of the get get things done thing. So I'll spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes, you know, laying out what the day is going to be, looking at the calendar, uh, and then I will generally do the fastest stuff first. I should probably do the frog stuff. Yeah, first. I was just going to say it wasn't I the know. frog. Uh, well, I don't want to do the frog. That's why. <laughs> what? Yeah, amen to that. Uh, what corner of theology are you currently obsessed with? And I mean corner, dusty corner. Uh that's a good question. I don't know. I'm still, you know, uh, I, I sort of can't overcome this concern and uh, about law and gospel and how that plays out, but that's not really a dusty corner. Um, no, it might be. Maybe it is. I don't know. This whole idea of, it's, it was funny that you, uh, when you asked me to do this, I had just given a, a lecture. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd covered Fries's pastoral class, and I am maybe the dusty corner, at least in our circles, that I'm interested in, which you didn't talk about, is actually leadership. Mm. Because that is kind of, you know, the other side is very, they're all about leadership. Yep. And the role of pastor's wife. And we rejected all of that wrongly yep. to our detriment. So I am interested in, you know, how do we actually inspire people to do things? How do we help them do things? And, you know, what is the role of the pastor's wife? Because it's, it's insane to say, don't tell me there's no such thing. That's right. stupid. Uh, it, it just isn't real. If you're the wife of the congressman, you have a role. If you're, the, if you're the wife of a policeman, you know, everybody has is defined by his spouse. We're not feminists. <laughs> and so the pastor's wife is a real role and a real thing. Now, that could be easily abused. Sure. And, we, and we've seen it be abused. But it's also an abuse to say she's just a member of the congregation. Yeah. So, you know, what, what, how does that all function and work? It's not, I don't know if that's not really quite theology, but it's related again to vocation and, mm -hmm. and a deeper understanding of what it is to serve your neighbor and how we're defined by our relationships. Hmm. So yeah, I, I, I think natural law is theology and I, the, the overlap there, I don't think is uh, too far off. I, and I totally am with you that for whatever reason in the worship wars, we lost productivity. We gave those guys. Those guys came along and wanted to be charismatics with their guitars, and then they said the word leadership and mission a few times, and we stopped talking about mission, and we stopped uh, trying to understand what leadership was. And it's it, – I'm going to take a pot shot because they're probably not listening. Uh, they don't know what they're talking about when they talk about leadership. They haven't actually read the real books. They've read all this Christian nonsense garbage from you know the, the Zondervan, and the actual good to great, if they were – when I read Good to Great and then recently How the Mighty Fall by Jim Collins, I can't tell you – how much he diagnoses the Kishnik era of exactly what was happening. We were doing everything we shouldn't have done according to the leadership books. Forget the theology. The, oh, man, it would, anyway. I don't, Kishnik, I'm sorry if you're listening. I don't, I don't hate you. Um, uh, if you could lead a two-week boot camp for young men the summer before college, what would it look like? Uh, it, would be a, it would be almost all physical. Huh. And uh, I think it would be, it would be heavy into... Uh, uh, exercise and 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 sport, uh, but it would be competitive sport mm. because I think that, uh, but not see not sport for. The problem is is the way that we do sport in America is we've made sport into a good of itself. Yeah, and I'm uh, I think for masculinity, what the the problem is is what we're lacking is a true kind of competitive fighting spirit that also supports teamwork. And uh, the, the sports that we do are too tribal, I think, is the problem. That's interesting, yeah. So it doesn't actually support masculinity. It actually becomes a kind of femininity because it's, uh, it's about my, I don't know if I'm even, I, I don't have a fully articulated thing. I think it's, thing. Really, it's curious what you're saying. Yeah, so I want to, in my fantasy world, I'd set up a kind of Spartan sort of yeah, uh, sure. system. Sure, okay. Yeah. One, of the, one of the best things St. Louis Seminary did was had a, a functioning intramural program where the teams were so broad that you didn't even all play on the same team. You had major team sports, you had individual stuff, but all piled into these eight teams. And I mean, uh, the, the bonds I formed there have endured theological disagreements that we have yeah. to this day. I mean, it's really something. Well, and you know, we have a masculinity crisis. Yes. So, I mean, we just, these, you know, these boys are being feminized. And uh, so I don't, I mean, I guess if uh, maybe I don't know what this, the, that's what I would want the camp yeah, to do yeah. is teach men how to be men. And in my mind, because this is my background, I always go to kind of a militaristic. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Um, 
What is the most important failure in your life? Uh, I don't think I can talk about my most important okay. failures. Okay, the, that's uh, fine. But, uh, the one that has uh, been the most significant in helping <laughs> Oh, the most significant in helping me? Well, uh, I have, I, my life, of course, like everybody's, is full of regret. I think professionally, the thing that I come back to all the time and I'm so ashamed of is that early, my early years in the ministry, I was so hard on my circuit brothers. Mm. And I came out of seminary with so much, you know, uh, fervor and zeal, which I don't think was wrong, uh, and I think could have been good, and in some ways maybe was, but I, 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 I was harder on those men than was in any way fair. Hmm. And I didn't look at them with sympathy or with any kind of reverence for their age and so forth. And I just regret that. I was... They were they they God be praised were nice to me because right. they recognized they'd seen my kind of animal before right um, and so I mean it worked out fine and they were nice to me and, and you know over time but when I look back at that I just think I can't believe I acted like that yeah makes me think of Luther's uh, quip about zeal uh, zeal without knowledge is fire without light uh, knowledge without zeal is light without fire. Uh, you got to be somewhere in the middle. You want fire and light. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you know you, we have to learn. And I like what you said about the bond that can that can go beyond theological differences. Mm. And you know, we have to learn to be again. This is part of masculinity to be a brother. Mm. You know, you can punch your brother. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, you're still brothers. But you're still brothers. Yeah. So, <laughs> this is not time for this at all. But you know, the circuit conference and the attempt to make that a a formation place for brotherhood and, and what a how it doesn't do that it doesn't and, and do it that, is yeah. not a, not uh, there to be that um what's your favorite bible verse <laughs> that's like asking your favorite hymn whatever one i'm reading <laughs> okay that's a good answer <laughs> what's your favorite non-bible quote uh the perfect is the enemy of the good okay yeah I love that it. is the that's, that's the most important philosophical reality for productivity and for life well then speak about it for a minute well that's it's just affects everything the perfect's the enemy of the good we we we, we are it, get back to grit this is how you develop grit mm -hmm. and i see this in marriage all the time the problem is is that we're not accepting of our wives because they're not perfect mm. and and it's ridiculous we ought, we got to take what we're given and rejoice in it and see what's good and is before us and not wait or pine, which is just coveting, mm. for something better. Mm. You know, mm. I see this with young men that are delaying marriage. I see this with uh, uh, young people choosing colleges and careers. And I see it with pastors that, you know, you can't write a sermon because it's not good enough. You can't, you just got to do it. Yeah. It's back yeah, to yeah. get to those, te your 200 words. Uh, Tim Ferriss's line that I, I, is the same idea, I think, is you got to let the small bad things happen to do the great good things. And, uh, uh, Ninety percent is usually more than enough. Uh, two more. What major idea have you changed your mind about in the last few years, and why? Uh, well, this whole third use of the law thing okay. uh, and sanctification. I mean, that's a huge. I was uh, certainly came out of the seminary and for a lot of years preached very much like Gerhard Ferdy. Okay. Uh, and you know, very much law gospel stuff. And um, I really think now, not that it was heretical what I was doing, but it was shallow. Okay. And uh, my sermons are not as popular as they used to be, but I, th I mean, they've changed. They've become much more didactic, and I think that that's what they're supposed to be. Yeah. That's yeah. what the confessions mean when they say teaching. Yeah. So this, this whole change from the gospel, the preaching is performative speech. Yes. Yeah. Which has a place. Yeah. But, but, but shifting from that being the sole purpose of a sermon to a broader understanding, it was a big change for me. Yeah, the you got to have some rhetoric in yeah. your in your training, but that this is this spiritual monologue I give for fifteen minutes to try to entertain you and, and make you feel loved, yeah. as opposed to the didactic. That's well, where I've just been so on the didactic train. Yeah, it, well, see, and I think for me it was a kind of an existential. I have to create this spiritual crisis in people yeah. with the law, yeah. and right. now they can have this wonderful gospel moment and you know it, and it, what, what's gotten me about that is then i'm no longer actually preaching the word of god that's right i'm preaching my own words and i'm trying to be god and it's just such i i, I pin that not on on ferdy so much as camera i think that's in camera stuff uh well there's a so david schmidt wrote a great article about 
about Kemmerer defending it and saying that everybody gets Kemmerer wrong. It's it's worth reading. Um, I think he makes a really compelling, yeah. and he says the problem is uh, Kemmerer is addressing an audience that was trained in rhetoric, and now we don't have any no, of that training, so we don't understand what he's well, saying. Well, then I won't lay it at Kemmerer's so anyway. actual feet. <laughs> I'll lay it at his ghost, because well, it's the ghost of, uh, I also think it's homiletics as a discipline, and yeah. Schmidt probably wouldn't like this. I think it doesn't belong in the church as a discipline. Uh, it, we have exegesis and we have systematics that is preaching it should be and if it's not it's not doing us any good it should be that i i read what the bible says and i communicate it in a way that you understand it that that's the, the the line between exegesis and systematics and i'm doing that for you week in week out homiletics comes out of methodist thinking about um uh, i even think revivalists and i don't i haven't done the the leg scholastic leg work to tie the dots together but the revivalist mindset of i've got to move this community i've got to sit, stand up here and, and provide this sort of structured um uh, again i don't rhetoric's the wrong word but structured thing in order to entertain you and bring in and, and that mentality and that study of the sermon as thing apart from word of god I, I just think it's been a black hole for us. It's taken us all in the wrong direction. Oh, I, I think you're 100% wrong. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, that, that actually um, this is a necessary discipline. But, I mean, that's a whole long other topic. I yeah, mean, I great. hear what you're saying, but I think you are misunderstanding. You're responding to uh, a, a kind of popular Protestant understanding of homiletics, which in, admittedly has invaded us. But, you know, we have Gerhardt writes, here's the steps to writing a sermon and here's what a sermon ought to contain. So I mean there's a history oh, I, okay, uh, okay. That, that that is much older than than this stuff. And not only Gerhardt, I mean, we have this in, in, in patristic literature even a little bit. So there's more to it than that. And I think ideally it is actually an understanding of what is the word of God and how is the word of God communicated. And it's not that it's it's kind of parallel to your productivity stuff. Yeah. I mean in that we do need to bring in some secular knowledge you know, to, or whatever. Right. Uh, well, but I anyway. you do need to have a, a, an understanding of rhetoric. Yeah, persuasive speech and so, uh, all sorts of things. Maybe what I mean is then that the school or the discipline as it now stands, I think is foreign. It's a foreign uh, appendage. Um, not that the idea of studying preaching is a bad idea, and I, but I don't think that's what it is anymore. At least, and, and, and I'm getting this from my education yeah, right right and and what was presented to me uh which did more damage to my ability to to be in the pulpit than well than uh, you're help. you're picking on something here i care about so i so i don't mean but the other thing is see i think the problem is is that we read these homiletics books hmm. when we're at seminary before we're ready for them and um really uh if you haven't read a homiletics book in the last 10 years i say shame on you jonathan okay yeah. because uh, uh because this is our craft and you ought to care about it okay and and the field of homiletics is uh is the academic field of homiletics is different than the zondervan book of the week okay um so i think there's more there than we realize and i think we're dismissive of it uh, for many reasons but one of them is the way we're introduced to it at seminary, I think is not ideal. Um, and the other thing I would, so the problem is, is we're reading this stuff like Kemmerer before we can understand it. Right. And, and then, and then we make an, imp it makes an impression that's not accurate. The other thing I think just related to this, I know I'm sorry. We're no, no, I'm just making sure that we the, have power. The, <laughs> the other thing is that I think that what homiletics ought to be more focused on uh, even though I like I like the discipline of homiletics, but I think it ought to be more focused on actually studying sermons, and 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 less on public speech. Okay. Um, I would like to see in my fantasy world what we would teach homiletics. Uh, first of all, by teaching people to imitate, instead of just saying, yeah. "Here's how you write a sermon." Here's now write now write a sermon right. from, out of your own brain and so forth, but that we would actually imitate preaching you know, as a way to grow into it. Yeah. But anyway, that was a long... No, that's good. That's good. And um, I, I like being disagreed with, even though <laughs> it's never pleasant, but uh, uh, it's good for you. Sure. Right? Yeah. Um, so that's good. Um, I don't know that I've read a... Well, see, I, um, The Preached God uh, was very helpful, even though that probably is not a homiletics book, but... Well, I mean, that's it's in the realm. I, yeah. You know. And then Why Johnny Can't Preach. I oh, found yeah. very helpful. But it's not really... See, I, I wouldn't put those as homiletics books, but they they were um, 
they were helpful. I, I would. Um, I think. I mean, it's not a. It's not a. Te- you know, it's not Buttrix homiletic or Lowry's. Yeah, you know, yeah. but but it's. I I think that's in the realm. At least you're studying and concerned about the art of preaching and very and so much forth. so. So that's very good. much so. I have this this bug in my bonnet about uh, scholasticism, and that's probably half of my problem. And we could have a great conversation about that. I'm sure as well. Um, yeah, you probably have already answered this. Uh, but what is the most important first article truth you see most people, and I don't mean pastors, uh, most people ignoring? It doesn't have to be prisoners either. It can be the American world. Most important first article truth we need to rediscover. Uh, that society is built upon the family. Okay. The family is everything. Yeah. yeah. Which makes me want to ask you again about, so <laughs> what, is a, what is a congregation structure that looks like or is built to be a family dynamic but remains a nonprofit organization. That yeah. is that is a fascinating thought. There's got to be a parallel reality. I mean, because sometimes the matriarch or the patriarch's not even on the council. But you wouldn't dare ignore this, right? So I mean, I think there has to be kind of a parallel thing going on. Sometimes they can they they, they hopefully do overlap. But but I think you kind of got both things. How, shouldn't the pastor be the patriarch at a certain point? And this is where it's like you got to endure but isn't that kind of the idea? You know, I don't know. I mean, it depends what role the patriarch is is uh, uh, forming. I mean, the the, the pastor uh, is, it, of course, it is a, a patriarchal position, but it's also it, it's such a didactic position. You're kind of the local philosopher, yeah, and ethical guide. You know, so like you said earlier, you know, the, the seminary didn't tell you that some of the people will hate you. You know, it's a little more, that's right, some of the people will hate you. A lot more of the people will just be intimidated by you. And they won't want to come to you because they're afraid of what you're going to tell them. Hmm. And they don't want to hear it. Yeah. You know, as Scare gave this great, right? I won't go to the doctor because whoever goes to the doctor gets, they they find out they're sick. (laughs) So, I mean, you're already sick. But the problem is, is they want to pretend like they're not. And so there's this weird kind of thing that I think often... The, the, the pastor might be the patriarch, maybe, but I don't think he has to be. Okay. I think he can kind of serve as the, the village wise man, right. you know, that he's there to guide the decisions. Isn't that what a father should be, right? And so, like, this gets to, like, why is the father not the philosopher of the house and, and, and so forth? But then we're, that doesn't necessarily make him a good leader. There's so, there's so much more. We, it, perhaps we'll do this again. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I really have enjoyed this conversation. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Pastor <laughs> David Peterson, uh, pastor at Redeemer Lutheran Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And your most recent uh, book, I think, that was released is the, is it the Advent and Epiphany Sermons, or was it the Lent and Easter Sermons? Thy Kingdom Come, Lent and Easter uh, Sermons? I don't remember which one. Like it's one. been a while. They're both pretty I old. thought they just both came out. No, they've both been out for probably five, six years Well, now, you least. probably would rather point people to Goddess Needs, the, I would. the that's Journal what, of Lutheran right. Liturgy. Um, <laughs> you ever get tired of being the liturgy guy? Uh, you know, it is funny. I, uh, yes, I don't, I don't even, so, uh, it's funny. I, I don't do it quite as much as I used to, but I used to have to really like field a lot of liturgical questions yeah. and rubrical questions. And the funny thing is I don't actually care that much about that stuff. <laughs> I mean, I do, I don't mean, I, so that's probably overstating it. No, but, it's but like, I get it. I look, it's just what we do and we just do yeah. it and I'm just happy to do it. I'm not, I don't spend my time reading you know, old rubrical manuals. I mean, there's people that do, and God oh, be I praised. I assume that's all you did all day. Yeah, I don't it, care. I mean, so I actually, that's just Studying not my, flavors of incense. That's right, that. right. <laughs> so what I, actually, so whatever, I have a question, you know, I would just call Mark Braden at Zion in Detroit, and sure. I just do whatever he tells me, because I just don't want to do all that work. I, I actually, so the thing I really like actually is, is homiletics, is preaching. But I know I am kind of do have to sometimes be the liturgical yeah, guy. yeah. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Was that worth a dollar? What about five? Project Resurrection is made possible by listeners like you and your patronage of my husband's work. Click the Patreon link in the show notes to sign up. Pretty please?